Welcome to Loyola Marymount University's Thomas and Dorothy Levy Center for the Study of Los Angeles 2008 Urban Lecture Series. I'm Fernando Guerra. I am the director of the Levy Center for the Study of Los Angeles. We established this lecture series over 10 years ago, and we did this primarily for three reasons. First and foremost, to provide an interdisciplinary education for hundreds of our students. Second, it is aired to over one million households like yours in the city of Los Angeles. Third, it also brings together government officials, business and community leaders, our students and others to discuss the challenges being faced by our city. For more information about the Urban Lecture Series, the Center for the Study of Los Angeles, and Loyola Marymount University, we welcome you to visit our website, which can be found at www.lmu.edu backslash CSLA. We hope you enjoyed today's lecture and we hope it inspires you to get involved in the challenges facing our great city. I'd like to welcome all of our students and guests in the room back to the fourth installment of the 2008 Urban Lecture Series and um, as well as all the viewers uh, watching on LA 36. On behalf of um, the Levy Center for the Study of Los Angeles at Loyola Marymount University, I'd like to welcome our, our panel tonight. Um, the people who will be speaking with you have all worked on various aspects of urban violence, which is unfortunately a subject very much in the news right now. We've had a whole series of, um, of shootings in South Los Angeles, Glassell Park, Echo Park, um, Harbor Gateway with um, six-year-old, 13-year-old, 16-year-old children getting shot and killed and injured. Um, just a little bit of information for um, some of the people who are new to the lecture series and also for our panelists. Most of the people who are here are enrolled in some class related to urban issues and um, they also all participated in an exit poll of voters in the um, primary election. And they're crunching the numbers right now and they're, and they're taking a look at um, the willingness of voters to step up and fund things like um, more cops and more prisons and subways and schools and um, gang intervention programs and all the rest of it. So hopefully we can talk a little bit about some of that. Um, but um, we'd like to focus um, tonight specifically on urban violence, specifically um, gang-related violence, domestic violence, other uh, forms of violence in our community. And let me um, introduce our panel um, who are here so far. Um, Patty Giggins is the executive director of Peace Over Violence, which um, used to be called the LA Commission on Assaults Against Women, which has been around for over 30 years in Los Angeles. And um, Ms. Giggins has been the director of that organization for more than two decades. Um, she has won all kinds of awards, including the California Peace Prize and a variety of others. And she is also a lethal weapon. She has about a third degree black belt, is that right, in karate? So underneath that, um, underneath that very conservative suit, you just better watch out. Um, and then peace, to my... Peace. Peace over violence. Over violence, right. Peace over violence. And then um, sitting next to me is LA County District Attorney Steve Cooley, who heads the largest uh, prosecution agency in the country. He's been the director, um, the um, head uh, district attorney for seven years now. And um, he actually, you've been with the uh, district attorney since you graduated from law school in 1973? That's correct. Um, and this is in a context, something that we've been talking about a lot, at least in my class, is the um, budget constraints that plague local government. And um, Mr. Cooley um, came to be the director at, the time, at a time when LA County was under very, very severe budget constraints. And despite that, he's been able to um, increase both the size and the expertise of the people um, who are um, prosecuting crimes in Los Angeles. So um, the people that we have here tonight, have with us here tonight, um, have a breadth of experience in combating um, violence in Los Angeles. And I know that um, these two individuals have worked um, closely together over many years um, um, in terms of anti-stalking um, policies, um, <coughs> increasing the use of um, 
uh, DNA rape kits um, that the LAPD um, collects. Um, I think most recently on human trafficking <coughs> issues. So um, I'm looking forward to um, hearing what um, you guys have to say about um, the topics that are before us. Um, let's just start, um, Mr. Klee, with you. If you could um, just sketch out for us, what is the overall trend right now in terms of um, violence in Los Angeles? Is it, is it worse here than it is in other places? Is it, wor is it worse now than it used to be? It's at an all-time historic low. I know that's hard to believe when you watch television, read the papers, hear about these tragic, <laughs> tragic stories of innocent uh, children, young men, sometimes women being gunned down in the gang violence, but the uh, crime rates at an historic low. They measure crime in the United States by uh, looking at a series of crimes that are relatively common, prosecuted in every state. Those are statistics are reported to the FBI annually, and our crime rate uh, in Los Angeles County uh, is at uh, the same rate it was in 1956. It is at an all-time low. Our homicides, uh, which is uh, one uh, category of violent crime that is very well tracked, very accurately tracked, is down 65 uh, percent from the two high points over the last 30 years. In the late uh, 70s, early 80s, uh, there were 2,500 murders in the county of Los Angeles and over 1,000 in the city. In the late 80s, early 90s, it spiked again to that point, over 2,500 in the county and over 1,000 in the city. This past year, we recorded in the low 900s in the county. You guys do the math. That's down 1,600. Uh, and in the city, they went from over 1,000, uh, those two high points, down to the low 400s, down 600 essentially a 60 to 65 percent drop. And that's during a time frame when our population in the county grew about 2 million and the city maybe 700,000 people. So against an ever larger population, our murders are an all-time low. That is a positive sign. That's the good news. Uh, and plus other crimes that are measured are also down substantially, historic low. The bad news is that one component of the most serious crimes, uh, those are the ones committed by gangs, are still the largest percentage of that historic low number of crimes being committed. Gang crime, whether it be uh, various forms of assault, attempted murder, murder, robbery, uh, is still uh, the most intractable uh, component of crime in Los Angeles County and Los Angeles City. And I think we draw from those statistics the fact that that's where our attention, our money, our focus, our priority should go in that direction uh, so we can impact that sort of last remaining vestige of perhaps a crime that we can uh, reduce substantially in our community and have a great uh, impact in terms of public safety. Let me ask you both, what is the problem? When we talk about youth violence, we hear about youth violence. What is this? Is it, is it a, um, a turf problem? Is it a drug problem? Is it a race relations problem? Is it a health problem? What, what is this problem? All of the above. <laughs> um, clearly, uh, the roots of violence are very complex, and what we're seeing um, since the beginning of this year is a resurgence of uh, a lot of gang, uh, violent gang activity. Uh, gangs, gangs have been around for a very, very long time, as you, as you well know. And um, the interesting aspects um, in terms of the work that, that we do at Peace Over Violence, which by the way, we're a uh, sexual violence, domestic violence, interpersonal violence, intervention and prevention center. So we, we're a victim advocates, advocacy organization. We have 24-hour uh, 24 emergen 24 emergency services. We will meet up with a victim at the hospital or at the police station, and we will be there, them, there through the process. If, they, if, if there is a case that goes, moves through the justice system, we can be there with them so they don't have to go through that process alone, and also through the healing process in terms of counseling and support groups, those kinds of things. So that's what we've, we, we've done for many years. But along the way, in the growth of the agency, just like everybody else, uh, including uh, 
our, our DA and a lot of people in law enforcement. After a while, you see the victims and you say, well, what can we do to prevent this? Because they keep calling, they keep coming through the door, more prosecutions. And we're at a stage now, I think, that we're beginning to look at what are the root causes of all the violences that we have in our communities. There's gang violence, there's family domestic violence, there's sexual violence, there's child sexual abuse, and obviously drugs is in there, poverty, economic conditions, lack of job opportunities, and then also some of the crisis that we have in our education system, in our elementary schools, in our high schools. So all of, all of these things come together to create um, an environment where the prevention piece, it's almost easier to try to find the guy that did it and prosecute than it is to try to prevent that person from committing the, the, the crime. So it's, it's very, prevention is very complex, but I think that what we're, we're at, a, at a place, I hope we're at a place, Steve, that we are, are looking at what can we do in Los Angeles in terms of the, the more root causes of all these different kinds of, of violence. Do you, do you think we are or not? Well, I think Jim McDonald, <laughs> the assistant chief for LAPD, who just arrived should oh, answer good. that question. What do you think, Jim? <laughs> Let me, um... No, I'd like to respond to what Patty said. She's right. There's, all, there's certainly a place for prevention. We're probably at a place where we know how expensive suppression is in terms of investigation, prosecution, just the cost upon the, uh, the victims and, and society. Prevention is obviously uh, the first place you, you want to go. Uh, intervention's good, too. There are a lot of intervention programs. But ultimately, when that crime occurs, the police and, and the, the DA have to play their constitutional role, their statutory role, and pick the pieces up, uh, prove that the crime occurred, find out who did it, and then punish them according to law. And we're going to fulfill that mission, no matter how good the prevention gets or intervention, there's still going to be those crimes that we're going to have to deal with uh, once they have occurred. You asked one question about uh, what's with the gangs, what's the, the, the theme, is it turf, is it race? Uh, uh, is it, what, what is it? And you did not mention one driving component of some of the gang activity, and that's drug trafficking. Some of these gangs <clears throat> exist uh, to uh, deal in uh, narcotics. Uh, this is their uh, source of revenue. This is their lifestyle, and that lifestyle uh, sometimes leads to uh, competition with others. And uh, ultimately, uh, murders. So that's a component, is uh, drug trafficking in our society. Race is certainly a component. I think it's a more, more recent phenomenon than historical. Uh, historically and statistically, most uh, murders are committed by a member of one race on a member of the same race. We are seeing an emergence, and this is documented over the last several years by the uh, LA County Human Relations Commission of racially motivated crime. And, and this is in the gang context. And it's, uh, the majority of it is brown gang members on black victims who may or may not be gang members. That is a documented fact. It's a recent phenomenon. And it's something that uh, we are seeing anecdotally in some of the more recent uh, tragic incidents. So that's uh, a factor. The traditional turf wars, um, in terms of a gang staking out a four or five block area, <clears throat> this is their turf, and you come on our turf, we're gonna shoot you, hurt you, stab you, kill you. Um, that's still around, it's not as dominant as it was in the uh, 50s, 60s, and 70s. So we have a, sort of a, a changing demographic in terms of uh, gang crime, and I think it's something we have to constantly monitor, study, because only by figuring out what's going on can you then do the things that Patty suggests is very important, and that's develop uh, prevention programs that are focused and effective. Let me ask you about the, um, the established criminals. I mean, what is the link between our, what's going on in our prisons and what's going on on the streets in terms of our gang problem? Some of the gangs, uh, some of the street gangs have a very substantial, solid 
um, uh, connections with the prison gangs. There are certain Latino gangs in Los Angeles that are directly connected to uh, MA, the uh, uh, Latino Mexican American uh, prison gang. Uh, there are murders that uh, are occurring in Los Angeles streets uh, uh, because of the taxes being imposed by the prison gang. There are uh, the violent boys out in North Hollywood, near where I live. Uh, they definitely have uh, that sort of a connection with the prison gangs. There are other gangs that are operating solely uh, uh, for their own existence. They're not really connected to prison gangs. It's not, not connected to some wider uh, drug profit motivated organization such as MA. And the real expert in this area is probably sitting over there, yeah. Chief McDonald. Let me, let me take a second to, to introduce um, Chief um, McDonald. This is. Um, um, Chief McDonald has been um, on the LAPD force since 1981. He um, is the recipient of the department's highest um, award for bravery, the Medal of Valor. And he's actually second in command at the LAPD. So maybe you can just give sure. us some of the, um, we've, we've heard um, from Mr. Cooley some of the, the trends in terms of what's going on historically and com in comparison to other cities. One thing I wanted to ask you about, though, is um, we're hearing right now about um, the mayor's push to hire more police officers and um, that the fact that um, Los Angeles is the most under-policed big city in the country. I think we have something like two and a half police officer, 2.5 officers for 1,000 mm -hmm. residents compared to New York, which has, you know, twice that number for a much smaller area. So. Um, how about that? If, high, you know, if we can put more cops on the street, sure. would that help this problem? Yeah, if I could, I'd like to uh, touch on a, a couple of things that were said before I came in. First of all, my apologies to all of you for being late. I hate being late for anything, and today, in the spirit of St. Patrick's Week, at Murphy's Law, anything that could have gone wrong did. <laughs> so, that, uh, first of all, uh, I wanted to get that on. Um, you know, as far as the, the direct question, uh, the mayor's hiring, the mayor has committed to the, to the department to continue his hiring despite the budget cuts that uh, are going to be faced across the board, I think. Um, we're very confident that, uh, that that will happen to the degree that it's at all possible, but the reality is in the city of Los Angeles, which is 467 square miles uh, compared to New York, which is about 280, we have 9,600 sworn police officers in this city. New York has uh, 36,000 and they're complaining because they don't have their full TO of 41,000. So when you look at it, we have half the officer to population ratio of New York, Chicago, Philadelphia. And uh, I just think that when we have the ability to put additional officers in an area, and for instance, uh, about a month or so ago, we started to see a, a gang war between uh, East Coast Crips and Grape Street uh, in the South LA area of the city. And we had one guy who had been shot and killed and he was a major player in one of those gangs, and as a result, we had 21 shootings, uh, six of those being murders in the next 72 hours. So we've had to pull officers from all over the city, and we put an additional 100 officers into that area, and in, in about a day, it stopped. There were no more shootings, there were no more murders. What we constantly have to do is move bodies around like a chess game to be able to keep our, our hand over the bleeding. And that's a sad thing to say, but that's kind of the reality that we face. So we have, you've probably heard about CompStat, our management accountability process, but a lot of CompStat deals with deployment. How many officers do we put in which areas? And we try and focus our resources, which are very limited, uh, to be the most effective, to put officers out there on the day of week and time of day when it matters the most, in the areas of the city that it matters the most. And you hear a lot about crime in the city. But if you were to put a map up on the wall behind me and put dots on where the crimes, particularly the violent crimes, are occurring throughout the city, unfortunately, it, they're concentrated in about six areas in the city uh, for the most part. Predictably, those are the heavy gang areas. Those are the poor areas of the city. So there's always the fight uh, between parts of the city that say, we pay the taxes and we want officers in our area, and they deserve that, and also striking that balance then and putting the, the cops on the dots, if you will, uh, to be able to get uh, keep the crime down, particularly keep the violent crime down, and to use the, the resources as smart as we can. Uh, the question be, as I was coming in, it talked about uh, the prevention. And 
I, I always uh, get asked questions, prevention, intervention. We got only so much money, where do we put it? Do we put the money into the police department, uh, which primary focus is the enforcement piece? And when you look at it, I think you gotta take a step back and you gotta realize that the police are only a small part of the system and that it should be a system. And Mr. Cooley talked a little bit about that. But you have to look at what are we dealing with? And you look at a kid who grows up in, a, in some of the tougher parts of this city and this kid comes into the world maybe to uh, a mother who's got drug problems coming in, oftentimes to a single family parent uh, with that, dr that complication on top of it, and then they, they're, they're either raised by a grandmother, which we see most frequently, or raised by a mother who, uh, if she's squared away, is working one or two jobs to be able to help make ends meet, or she's being raised by you know, whoever's around to help out. Uh, that kid then will go to school the support systems that many of you and, and my kids have taken for granted, that you come home, you get a little breakfast before you go to school, you have some kind of support that when you get home, you have an environment to be able to do homework, you have safe passage to and from school. Uh, the kind of things that in America we, sh we should take for granted. Oftentimes these kids don't have that. And a lot of them are afraid to just go to school and to come back from school because of the passage through gang neighborhoods and they get jumped both ways. So a lot of kids, you know, when you think of why do people join gangs, some of them join gangs because they feel they have to just to get home with their tennis shoes or with their jacket without that being stolen. <coughs> and they'll join it just to, just to say that they're part of something, something bigger than themselves. And I think what's missing too often is hope and a vision for tomorrow. <clears throat> Excuse me, I've worked, uh, I've worked gangs and I've worked homicide for a lot of my career. And I remember sitting down with kids back in the 80s even and nothing's changed. And you talk to a kid and you'd say, you know, what, what's, you know, you're 13 years old, you're caught with a gun, you know, you haven't done anything with it yet, but you know what this is gonna mean? Where are you gonna be five years from now? And they don't have a vision of being anywhere five years from now, because many of them don't believe they're gonna make it to see their 18th birthday. So you, without that hope or without a vision of something for the future, you know, we're, we're lacking as a society. We haven't provided that simple structure to, to many of our youth to have something to look forward to for tomorrow. And if you don't have anything to look forward to tomorrow and today is survival and that's your main deal of the day, then you're gonna do stuff that doesn't seem rational to the rest of us who are judging, judging people, other people, by our own standards and, and our expectations based on our own experiences. So very frustrating and I think that um, we need to take a step <coughs> back as a society and realize this is not gonna be changed in a four year election cycle period. It's not gonna be changed in a budget cycle. It's something that we have to commit to uh, to be dealing with over the next two or three generations to be able to turn around something that's taken a long time to get as bad as it is. And it's gonna take, the, the, uh, first of all, the nutrition, the, uh, the education, the intervention, the prevention, uh, the enforcement piece has to be there, and that's the police part. The prosecution that Mr. Cooley deals with has to be there to, to deal with those who don't belong in society. But the reality is when we put people in jail or prison, they don't stay there forever. So we also have to deal with the rehabilitation and the reintegration piece, and if we don't do that, we're very short-sighted. Because what we've created in many of our neighborhoods that many of you go home to wherever you come from and you wear proudly and rightfully your LMU sweatshirts, that's your sign of success. That's your parents' sign that you, they've done a good job in raising you. Well, to too many of the kids in our neighborhoods, in our tougher neighborhoods, they go away to prison and they come back with a prison tattoo. And that's their sign of success, that they're validated in the culture that, uh, that they're, in the lenses they're looking through. And as long as we have uh, you know, structures set up where we support exactly the wrong things, we're gonna continue to get more of the same. So I think we need to take a step back, look more holistically at the picture we're dealing with, not just focus on the, uh, the prosecution or the enforcement piece, but to look at it as how do we deal with somebody in a, in a more, I guess, and it probably sounds funny coming from a cop, but a more nurturing way to be able to help the whole person over the course of their life and their families. You ask any cop on the street who's worked the same area for a long period of time about dysfunctional families, and they can tell you, you know, four or five names of families that they've arrested if they've been around a while, they've arrested the kid, the father, and maybe the grandfather, and all sorts of brothers, cousins, and relatives. And unless we do something to step in and break that cycle, and you can talk about everything from physical abuse, sexual abuse, and on and on that cause people to get a certain way, but if we don't break that cycle, we're gonna to continue to get more of the same as well. I see Ms. Giggins nodding her yeah. head emphatically. Could I just add to that uh, very graphic picture that you, that you just painted? Um, this morning, I was invited to the Southern Youth Correctional Center and Clinic in Norwalk, and to the sex offender unit of uh, 200 youth 
from 14 to 22 year, years old who are there. Uh, they're there because when they went to camp, they couldn't make it in the camp. Um, and now they're in this treatment program for sex, sex offenses, and, which means it's pretty serious. And this was the first time that a victim advocacy group has gone to speak to these youth. And they are in heavy duty treatment and are trying to take responsibility and learn about the harm that they cause through their sexual offending. And there's a very high recidivism for sexual offending. Um, and uh, I, I have to say that when they start, they, they prepared for us poems, essays about their lives, about the treatment program and the impact on them. And they talked about how when they were five or six or seven or eight years old, that they were sexually assaulted by men and by women, men or women. And uh, a little bit about their families and the support system that wasn't there for them. And they weren't talking about it as if it was an excuse. They were talking about it because part of the treatment program is for them to understand themselves and what their lives were like and how they were traumatized. And one of the things that we've been looking at is the effect of domestic violence, the connection between all these issues, domestic violence and gang, joining gangs, gangs activities. And I'm, you know, I'm almost willing to say, you, you scratch a, a gang member these days and you're gonna find that they've witnessed domestic violence, have probably had some early sexual experiences that they probably shouldn't have been having, that they were um, neglected, they went to uh, schools where they were kind of just either moved along until they were sent to, uh, you know, got in trouble and were kicked out. And so this family violence component, this domestic violence in their lives is a real critical thing because we understand now that kids start acting out within the family, then they start acting out in the community. And I think this, 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 this what you're talking about, stepping back and trying to figure out how do we because it's true, we have to do the suppression, we have to do the police interventions. And <coughs> abusers need to be held accountable, absolutely. Well, I was really moved by listening to their stories today, and not because I don't know that some of them have maybe have offended 100 times, or they might maybe have created 100 victims before they got caught. You know, I understand that. But the fact that in this treatment program, they were trying to hold themselves accountable, but get underneath to find out what went on in my life and the trauma. Because if they don't understand that, when they do get out, they're gonna keep doing it. I wanna uh, ask a little bit more about this connection between um, family violence and gang violence. But first, let me take a second and um, welcome Council Member Jack Weiss, who represents the 5th District, which includes parts of the San Fernando Valley and West Los Angeles. Um, Council Member Weiss, you were elected in um, 2005 to your second term, and um, he is um, well versed in the issues we're talking about today. He chairs the Council's Public Safety um, Committee. <coughs> he has um, been a strong advocate in the City Council to increase the size of the LAPD, and I know you've worked very closely with um, Peace Over Violence to um, try to encourage the LAPD to actually use those um, rape um, kits for DNA uh, testing to put um, rapists and others away. Um, Patty, say a little bit more about um, this holistic approach. I mean, it seems to me that um, this, um, the way we talk about these issues, um, you know, either in terms of a war on gangs or um, in terms of an epidemic of youth violence, you know, whether you're talking about a, this issue in terms of a war or an epidemic that demands, you know, a public health response. You're talking about very different approaches and strategies, and I'm just wondering if that um, that framework makes sense. Well, I don't think it's an either or, uh, and I think um, a public health strategy or a social issues strategy or um, preventions where you develop much more solid educational system so youth can stay in school and not become alienated uh, and lost in these systems, um, along with the enforcement pieces. I don't think it's either or, but the, the, the public health approach kind of looks at all the social, the social costs. You know, the social costs, it's billions of dollars 
it costs for health care in terms of domestic violence. Women in the workplace who are off from work, many of them lose, uh, are out of work from one to five days in any given year due to domestic violence. So the cost in the workplace, the cost to health care, it's not just the cost in terms of the criminal justice system. It, the impact of these kinds of violences on, on the economy is, is tremendous. So in terms of taking a public health approach is to add this dimension of getting at trying to figure out, and we don't have the answers, that's for sure, um, and being bold enough to have some experiments uh, to get at some of the root causes and develop systems that can take a child who is having things happen to them, adverse things, and get the supports for that child. And if it's not coming within the family, where is it gonna come from? If it's a dysfunctional family. You know, there's so, so many studies say that if there's one critical, supportive mentor person, one positive person in a child's life when everything else is falling apart, that that one person can make a tremendous, tremendous difference. The public health model has to do with looking at the cause and trying to treat the person with all those multiple, multiple causes. Let me throw this out to all of you. Um, is our system, is our criminal justice system, everything from the courts to the, the jails and everything in between, is it set up to do what, what, you're, what I'm hearing is necessary? And, and if not, what would you change? Can I, can I jump in on, on just that? Because I think it's, um, it actually it enables me to offer something which I think is, if nothing else, a great final exam question or a course paper. Uh, yeah, right topic um, because because uh, here's 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 the bottom line um, I've worked with Jim McDonald and the LAPD to hire more police officers and we're doing that and that's a good thing and an important thing I've worked with Patty uh, on uh, the sort of services that peace over violence provide and on the issue of DNA testing um, and that those are good and important things we need more of that and I used to be I used to be a prosecutor um, uh, which is what Steve does, and we need more prosecutors. But it, the real issue, to get at your question of, is the system set up to deal with these issues, is the fact that when all of you graduate, and hopefully um, many of you will choose careers in public service or the public sector, the real question is, if you go into government service or the public sector in one, two, three, four, five years from now, you're gonna be entering government at a time of extraordinary pressures on the budgets of every single layer of government and nonprofits as well in this state and in this county. And you're gonna be going into government at a time when people are more reluctant than ever to see their taxes raised and when there are more, more competitive pressures on each public dollar than ever before. And so the real question for you to figure out as young policy analysts is not whether we need to do all of these things, because we do, but how you prioritize and what essential things you put at the top of the list uh, above all the other essential things. And that's the real challenge in government these days. Because we, I mean, we all agree we need more of these things. Now, if I were to make those decisions, um, which is the, the, the point of the question, the way I would answer them, is um, we need to prioritize the things, uh, we, need, we need more cops, we need more prosecutors, but we need to think differently in the 21st century about these issues than we have before. That's why I've emphasized uh, the use of science to test DNA evidence that's collected from sexual assault victims, but frankly in the future from a, a whole bunch of criminal situations. We haven't done that as a society, as a government generally in the past, we haven't done it well. We're going to have to put our money in places like that where we get much greater yield and efficiencies than we have in other parts of the system. That, that indeed, that question hovers over this gang issue right now, which is by which metric do we judge how well our public dollars uh, are being used by different gang programs, right? right? One of the problems is we don't have metrics by which to judge whether those dollars are being used effectively. And I would just suggest you're gonna be entering in this field, hopefully you will, at a time when 
um, you're not going to have any, any expendable resources. If I could jump in there a little bit, I think uh, the councilman brings out some, uh, one thing that struck me is that you're asking us for some answers and you've seen what we've done, you know, the best we can with what we have, but some of the answers are right here in this room. Yourself and people like you who are gonna come forward and say, you know what, what you tried didn't work, let's try something different. And it's those fresh kind of ideas that really, I think, will go a long way in making this a better world as we move forward. But I think it comes back to looking at the holistic approach. And do we call, do we call it a war on gangs? Do we call it gang violence and epidemic? You know, I, I think you can, you can look at it both ways, but if it means war, it means an epidemic, then normally we'd put all our resources and focus into fixing it. And we really haven't done that. We've done it kind of piecemeal. Is it a system uh, that's set up to, for success? I would argue that probably not because we compete for budget dollars, we work in silos, you have the police, you have the prosecutors, you have so many different silos of people, the service providers. If, uh, if you were aware about, oh, six months or so ago, Connie Rice, who's uh, who, who very, uh, I think, well known in the town, she came out with a report that talked about on the gang issue, the, uh, the fact that we spend a billion dollars a year, or just short of that, on gang intervention, prevention, and education. And there's no accountability for that money. It goes to a variety of different entities who have some piece of the pie, but is there anybody overseeing that to say, <coughs> are we getting to where we want to get to? And we, we real, there really isn't. There isn't that level of accountability or responsibility for the end of the day being able to say that was money well spent. A lot of people are putting a lot of hard-earned money into making things better, but I think we could do a better job across the board, whether it's police, whether it's private, uh, private agencies, private nonprofits, uh, service providers, gang interventionists, all the way across the board to try and, and work better together. Uh, and I think we've taken steps in that direction and I can honestly say that my 27 years on the LAPD, we were not the best with working with others, whether it was others in the criminal justice system, whether it was the community or, or any of the other players that you could bring to the mix. And I can say that since 9-11, uh, from every tragedy comes some good, and the good that came out of that was we were forced to work better together and to realize that none of us can do it alone, that we all have to have any success, we have to all be focused on the same thing. Let me, you know, I, I just wanted ahead. to add one little piece about that. Is, um, it's so interesting that um, the term war on gangs. Um, we've had wars on drugs, and we still have drugs. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure, I'm thinking that maybe we have to all of us reframe the way we mm -hmm. uh, the way we look at it from a, from a language, yep. you know, what is it about these gangs? How are we gonna, if we're gonna approach it from a war, it's like then we're gonna have, you know, look at the war in Iraq. You know, we just, we just have more, more damage, more tragedy. So I think, so culturally, that's what I, so my point is about culturally and how we look, we've made some progress in terms of domestic violence. You know, 30 years ago, 20 years ago, domestic violence wasn't that big an issue. People didn't recognize it for what it was, you know. But, um, for example, law enforcement now takes it very seriously. There is accountability for batterers, for abusers. There is much more accountability. So, but there's still a lot of attitudes that minimize the impact and the effect of interpersonal violence. And in, in terms of sexual violence, a lot of the myths still persist about if a, if a girl wears um, short skirt so she shows her, her navel, that means she's asking for, if she gets assaulted, that she was asking for it. Or if she's out partying, that she was asking for it if she got, if she got, so she got raped. Those attitudes still persist. So I think that attitudes about gang members, not every gang member is a violent gang member. Um, so there's, I, I just think that the way, when you talk about yeah, this holistic, yeah. you know, trying to think about it, we, we so easily get into the, the stereotypes of all of these things, and I think we have to be really provocative yeah. if to, you, if I could, with each other. You're right on the money. I think we talk about the war on gangs in the 80s. We did that at the LAPD. We put all our resources into focusing right. on taking crash. out the worst of the worst. We had the crash units, which right. were the gang units around the city. We had Operation Hammer, where we'd bring a 1,000 cops to the Coliseum of Sports Arena, have a roll call, and, and turn them loose to go out and, and put you know, bad gang members in jail. And the military model was not the right one. It was an efficient model to be able to get a lot of people together and to get them out there. But when you look at where are we trying to go with this, if we declare war on something, we're declaring war on ourselves because we're, we're talking about our own communities. And too often I think that the, the message that goes out is, is exactly the wrong one. 
us against them rather than how do we fix ourselves because it's, it's part of all of us. I want to ask a little bit more about some of the specific uh, work that each of you um, is doing and what, what programs you have that you're optimistic about. But I, I do want to ask uh, the council member about some issues that are in the news right now. Um, the city's um, program for gang intervention, the LA um, Bridges program, has been criticized as just being a way essentially for um, members of the city council um, to dole out favors to some of their supporters. And um, um, there's a uh, proposal right now to centralize a lot of the um, anti-gang programs within the office of the mayor. And I just wanted to get your, your thoughts on sure. both of those. Sure. And, and just to be, to be clear, it's not just or specifically that, that one program, Ellie Bridges, which is tell me, $20, $30 million a year, something in that order of magnitude, that that program uh, isn't working and needs to be brought under the control of the mayor's office. It's that all of the different gang intervention and youth opportunity programs that the city has are being, uh, a, there isn't the accountability that Chief McDonald was talking about, and B, there isn't, there isn't any central coordination or control or thought given to any of them. And see, finally, your point that many of them are used by council members. Um, I, I don't have any in my district, so I don't think they're talking about me, um, but that they're used by others for um, political purposes uh, that are not related to uh, efficiency. And the two principal critiques uh, of this issue were, number one, Connie Rice's comprehensive report, which the chief mentioned, and uh, number two, uh, our city controller, Laura Chick's um, uh, report on gang accountability, on, on the accountability in, when it comes to gang programs. That's the report that recommended that all those reports go into the mayor's office. And I agree with that conclusion. I'm going to vote to do that, um, to provide accountability. Um, now, not everyone on the council agrees with that position, um, and there is going to be uh, a council debate. Um, I, I'm hopeful that um, I, I think we are at a different place politically with this city council as opposed to other councils in the past, uh, under past mayors um, and, and with past councils, uh, this battle had, had been waged and uh, you say the council quote unquote won, I guess, uh, won, if, if, if winning can be bad, <laughs> past councils won. Um, I don't think that outcome is going to happen. I think that there are council members who are resisting the change, but they are, but, but, but there's far fewer than a majority of them. Um, so I'm hopeful that that is going to, is going to get turned around. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I just want to make one more point, which is that there is a, he's a gangs, he's called the gang czar. He doesn't like being called the gang czar. Um, Jeff Carr, he's a, he's a, he's a minister. Um, he'd be an excellent speaker here because you want to talk to someone who just lives it and walks it and breathes it 24-7. Uh, he's a very unique guy. And um, uh, I, as much as I have faith in processes in government, sometimes you meet someone and you realize as an individual you've got to put your faith in him or her. And, and, and I think it would be a very good thing for the city to centralize those gang programs under Jeff Carr. Yeah, I, we do have one of those. We, we participate in one of those gang programs at LA Bridges. And um, from an, an insider perspective, um, I totally agree with the, uh, how we are not being as effective as we need to be. Absolutely. And it's chaos. And part of it is because of the decentralization that's going on. You know, so. Mr. Curley, tell me about um, the relationship between how the county works with the city and all the other uh, cities in the area that have gang problems. What's, how, how are these different programs coordinated across jurisdictions? Assuming they're coordinated across jurisdictions. <laughs> and they effectively uh, aren't very well. Uh, the, the structure of government in the county of Los Angeles is uh, relatively simple and straightforward. There's one county, 10.4 million people, 4,400 square miles. It has one uh, of the largest cities in the country within that county, Los Angeles City. It's about a third of the population, 3.2 million people or so. Then there are 87 other cities in the county of Los Angeles and they have vastly different characteristics. One is as small as the city of Vernon, has 91 residents and 62 voters. It's basically an industrial city 
where 40,000 people come in every day and work, and there's a small component of people left behind. That's a very unique city. You have some incredibly wealthy cities that are basically gated communities uh, in, within the county. You have other cities that are working class cities. Um, and so you have a, a lot of different uh, characteristics of governmental entities. And they don't have the same problem. I can assure you that Rolling Hills, which is down that away, doesn't have a major gang problem. The city of Bradbury <clears throat> doesn't have a gang problem. They may have a burglary problem because so many wealthy people live there, but they don't have a gang problem. So you have different interests, different motivations uh, to <clears throat> engage in this issue. And how they're going to prioritize their law enforcement resources really depends upon what they perceive to be their need. And it's not, uh, so you're not going to have unanimity among the elected officials from those different cities because they're there hopefully to serve their constituents' uh, needs and, and priorities. And uh, that's really what their, their job is. Um, but in terms of how we um, interface with one another, there's a lot of anecdotal failure uh, and there are a few great successes. The problem with some of our <clears throat> political leaders is that even when they are shown to them, proven to them beyond a reasonable doubt, that something categorically works and saves lives and reduces crime and helps solve the problem, they do not spend the money <clears throat> to replicate it and spread it around. They continue to spend money wastefully on some programs that are probably more a cause of the problem than a solution. And I'll give you one example, an LA City a sponsored program called No <clears throat> Gun Violence. Gun, we're, we're all against gun violence. What a great name for an organization. And that was supposed to be their purpose. Let's get guns off the streets. Except the guy being paid by the city to get guns off the streets was enhancing his salary at No Gun Violence by doing what? Selling guns illegally to gang members. Uh, incredible waste. Uh, so if they could actually assess these programs, audit them, monitor them, tell them if you don't produce a measurable product that we know is contributing to the solution, you're gone. And that's not what's been done in the city of Los Angeles or other cities for that matter, but basically the city of Los Angeles is the big, is the big elephant. Uh, they've not done it and uh, it's unfortunate. They've wasted millions upon millions upon millions of taxpayer dollars on completely ineffective programs, and uh, they've not really taken the time to figure out what works and what doesn't work. There's one thing that works, I know Jack knows this, uh, I know the Chief knows this, and that's the CLEAR program. The CLEAR program, and we have a report here, which is gonna be released uh, to the public in the next couple of weeks, that documents how the CLEAR program works, and that is one, at least one program I know of interagency collaboration that had clear guidelines at the front end in terms of what the goals were, and it had uh, uh, easy to understand measures of success at the back end. And it's every place it's gone in the city of LA or the county of LA, it's worked. But for whatever reason, we don't seem to get the money to replicate this when we spot emerging uh, gang areas or gang areas where the crime is increasing. Uh, if I had one suggestion, I'd say go through your budget at the city of LA, some of the rest of these cities, get rid of the junk, and there's a lot of junk in there. Take that money, put it in a pot, go out and, and do uh, the things you know work, are proven to work. And quite frankly, with uh, the, sort of the turf wars between the elected officials in terms of who's going to be in charge and where are we going to put the, uh, you know, the chairs on the deck of the Titanic? Uh, I'm not so sure they're ever going to get there. I just don't have a, a lot of faith uh, that we're going to do something that is nothing more than common sense uh, and straightforward. I, I, I know the council member is going to have a response to that, but let me, let me ask you, Councilman, um, would the kind of violence that we're seeing in these um, six hot spots that uh, Chief McDonald noted, 
would those kind of conditions be tolerated by your constituents in the fifth? No, no, no. They, they wouldn't be. And it's not a response. I agree with the critique. I mean, that's, these, are, these are some of the themes that I've been, uh, you know, been, been focused on as well. Um, it, uh, uh, and, and, uh, and, and that's why I've been taking the position that I have on Connie Rice's report and on the controller's report, because I, I, I've, I've never liked these programs. Uh, they're not my programs, indeed, as the premise of one of your earlier questions indicated. Um, they have other political patrons, and that is part of the problem. I just want to set the scene, though, for all of you, because it's a it's government class. And, and there's something that it's, this is such a critical point to understand with respect to whether it's crime or any of the other public policy points you're going to be studying um, uh, at, at, at this level or when you get out and practice in the government, which is that the system of governments in the LA area was set up to fail, and we are witnessing that failure. I mean, we have this progressive background 80, 100 years ago when the governments, all the governments in this region were set up to make power diffuse, to have this city here, that county there, this agency here, that there. And so what if we, and, and you know, that was, it was set up at a time when big government was thought to be bad, when centralized control was thought to be bad, when centralization was thought to lead to corruption or temptations or too much power. Well, what do we have today? We have a, a city of four million people. LA has about four million people with a budget of about $5 billion. We have 87 other cities uh, in the county with their own budgets. We have a county with a budget of about, what is it now, 15, 20 billion dollars, something in that order of magnitude. We have an independent school district, LAUSD, with a budget of about $10 billion. We have dozens of other police, fire departments, and school districts just in this county. 10 million people. Now compare that to New York City. New York City is both a city and a county, or it's a con conglomeration of counties. All told, one person, the mayor of New York City, proposes an annual budget of roughly 40, 50, 60 billion dollars a year. One person, the mayor of LA, proposes an annual budget of one-tenth of that. So when you think about the fact that in New York you have a system with one mayor, one council, they control all the public safety budgets and all the education budgets, does it make for a perfect system? No, but it makes for centralized control, command control, analysis, and accountability. In LA, to get back to that earlier question of yours, which is such a key question, because if a crime starts in Watts, it can end up in Willowbrook, it can end up in Linwood or Carson or Torrance or any of the other cities in the county that are not Los Angeles. No, we don't have coordination because this is exactly the failed system that, was, that, that, that it was set up to be because we don't have centralized control and accountability uh, as a region. And it's really a shame. Okay, so this is pretty depressing that we have a system that is set up to fail um, so what do we have that's working, or what are some models, given our tight constraints, given our, um, our fiscal constraints, given the structure of our government, what are some programs that um, we have here in Los Angeles or that we can borrow from other places that, that uh, could work or that, that are working? I'll jump well, in well, on first, that well, well, go ahead, Jim. Go ahead. Well, first of all, a lot of things work very well in Los Angeles. Uh, Los Angeles County DA's office has the finest gang prosecution unit in the country, bar none. You ask anyone throughout the United States of America, where do they go or who do they hire to do their training for gang prosecution programs? It's the LA County DA's office. There are a lot of things we do very well. We do it out of necessity because we have more gang murders, more gang crime. We've gotten very good at vertically prosecuting gang members. Our conviction rate is primarily the work of the LAPD and the LA County Sheriff's, but some other agencies, our conviction rate in gang jury trials is 92%. That's phenomenal to get, because uh, you know, jury trial requires beyond a reasonable doubt, 12 people agreeing, that's always pretty hard, uh, but a 92% conviction rate. But that's the picking up the pieces part of the puzzle. That's the suppression part of the puzzle. We are doing a lot of things very well here, so let's not uh, you know, get, get too concerned that the system is broken. Certain parts of the system work very well. We are locking up more violent people and gang members 
at higher rates and for longer times than we ever have in our history, which is probably the reason we have this low crime rate right now, this low homicide rate right now, because we are very good at that component. Now, when it comes to uh, rehabilitating them so they don't recidivate, or we're not doing very good in that department, we're probably the worst in the country. When it comes to prevention intervention, I think we've got a lot to learn there. We're wasting a lot of money. A lot of good taxpayers' money is going uh, you know, down uh, because we have uh, ineffective um, governments, uh, governmental leaders, systems, and uh, people who basically feed off all that extra money to run programs that, quite frankly, um, aren't, worth, um, uh, aren't worth anything. Uh, on, the, on the subject of intervention and prevention, let me ask um, Patty, first of all, what, explain the name change from L.A. Commission on Assaults Against well, Women. Our, our organization cha we changed our name. For 35 years, we were the Los Angeles Commission on Assaults Against Women. And uh, about a year ago, we changed, uh, we became Peace Over Violence. And we did that because <coughs> we were realizing that over the years, we were doing so many more services for not only women, but for boys, for girls, and, and, and men were very much interested in becoming allies. A lot of the sexual and domestic violence issues were always seen as like a woman's problem before. But there were many more men um, who wanted to get involved, and so the name was not very inviting. And we also wanted an, a name that was um, inspirational and aspirational, like why are we doing all this stuff? Um, and it's, it's interesting because I think one of the things that does work, um, and this is, it's outside the government, but it actually works in tandem with helping the government and the governmental public institutions work better, and that's the advocacy programs where we have community members, we train them how to be advocates, and they are the folks who will go with a victim survivor to the police station, to the court, and we have counseling programs for people who do not want to report their, the, their victimization to the police. You know, most rapes are not committed by strangers. 75% of the rape, rapes that happen are committed by intimates or acquaintances, and a lot of them do not get reported, but they will come to us and programs like ours. There's a whole network of, of crisis centers that can help. So there's a system there that is um, that advocacy system where it involves community members, just like you who can get involved. And um, it also helps, it keeps, it ha that helps keep some of the public agencies accountable. I know that I work with all these gentlemen here um, where we try to work together to, uh, to, to, to help victims and to, not only to heal but to seek justice. So that, I think that's a system that we have that, that actually works, works well. Yeah, if I could just jump in a little bit on that. I think, you know, you see four people up here and we're fairly open about being critical about our own organizations and about our ability to be able to do the mission that we're, that we're tasked with doing. And I think when you compare Los Angeles and the region with the rest of the country, I think there's a propensity to be more critical of ourselves. And I think that's why we're able to, mm -hmm. to get some of the results we do. We're constantly talking about better ways to do things. What are, the better, what are the best practices? And we're sending people all over the world to look, to steal ideas from others that may work for them and see if it works for us. And so there's a, a level of creativity here in this region that I don't think that you see, at least in policing, uh, throughout the rest of the country and, and around the world. We talked about some of the systems, and, and they were set up with good intention to avoid corruption. The Tammany Hall and, and all of the abuses of the past where you had centralized government and you had a bad guy running the show, so the whole, the whole thing was bad. If with the, there was nowhere near the levels of accountability, the scrutiny on government officials in those days that there is today. So for that to happen today the way it happened in days of old, I think that uh, a person would be exposed much, much sooner. As far as what works, we have a, a thing in uh, set up a, a system, uh, JRIC, the Joint Regional Intelligence Center, and it's for terrorism, and it came out of 9-11. And it's, uh, it's something that works very well, where we have uh, the FBI, the, the CIA, we have people back in the uh, Homeland Security uh, Command Post, we have working with the sheriffs, the fire department, the medical uh, resources that we have in the region uh, for biohazards and other things that you might see. And there's an awful lot going on there that you never hear about and probably never will hear about unless there's an event 
but it is working very well. The level of collaboration and cooperation there is unprecedented. It has become the model for the rest of the country. They come in all the time and say, how are you doing it? How do you get the police and the fire to work together? And it's, uh, it's something that we're very proud of. But I think if we walk out of here thinking that it's all doom and gloom, um, you know, it's because we are self-critical. And when you look at where are we today versus where were we five years ago in the city of Los Angeles, uh, gang crime is down dramatically. Homicides are down in half from where they were. We were, we were the uh, murder capital of, of the country in 2002. And we had, I think, 635 homicides. Last year, we finished out the year with under 400. That's still 400 too many in the greatest city and the greatest country in the world. But when you think about it, we've come a long way in a relatively short period of time. So altogether, we have a lot to be proud of. So I think that we don't do a good enough job touting the successes and the things that would keep people on track trying to do more good things. And people often, you know, we focus and we all have a tendency to focus on the negative. We kind of throw our hands up in frustration and walk away when really there's a lot of people working very hard and getting some very good results. And the ability to be able to share that through the media has been very limited for us and that's very frustrating as well. But congratulations to, to this city and this region for being able to get the results that we have. Because we talk about numbers, but each one of these numbers represents a life and represents that family's life and, and well-being. Because you have somebody who's been raped, you have somebody who's been murdered, who's been shot, who's in a wheelchair, and we see it every single day. And that doesn't just affect that person, that affects that whole family and, and their friends and, and to some degree that piece of the neighborhood. It not only uh, directly, we've estimated that for every homicide that we have, the cost to society is a million dollars in, in lost wages and in, in potentials and across the board. And that's just the tangible stuff. The intangibles, there's a life that was never realized. Uh, what contribution could have been made, we'll never know. But just the, the monetary impact is a million dollars. So you figure going from 653 uh, murders in, in 2002 to less than 400 last year, that's a tremendous opportunity cost that has been saved as a result of uh, the work of the community, the police, the prosecutors, and, and everybody working together. And Jim, it's even better than that, because I told him, and this is verified, that it was 1,000 murders in the city in 8990, and 7980, it hit 1,000 in the yeah, city, 2,500 in the county. 1,192, right. uh, that was our worst year, it was terrible. You know, it, it seems to me, I mean, this all sounds pretty positive, but it just seems to me that when um, your average, you know, person turns on the news or opens up the LA Times and they just see story after story after story, another shooting, another shooting, mm -hmm. another shooting, and it's, you know, attributed to gang violence. Mm -hmm. It just seems to me that there's a tendency, or that there might be a tendency, especially among voters, to just, you know, hunker down and say, okay, I'm going to buy my, I'm going to invest more in my, you know, home security alarm, or whatever, my, you know, my lock my doors and whatever. I, I don't know if it's going to um, really um, encourage people to go out there and, and, and vote to raise their own taxes to pay for more yeah. cops or, you know, better jails or... or you know, better um, prevention programs. That, that would be another good panel probably for this group is talking about the media, the media's portrayal of public safety, education, and, uh, and public health. But you look at it just from a police perspective, um, probably in the city of LA, maybe 10% of the murders are reported at all in the media. And those that are reported generally are the more sensational a young kid is hurt, there's multiple murders, there's a major shooting, or it's captured on video. Um, when you look at all of the others' lives that are lost, Jill Leovi, who works for the LA Times, mm -hmm. has done a good job on the homicide blog that she puts together. If you haven't seen that, it's worth looking at. But it talks a little bit about each of the victims, and these are all people. Mm -hmm. And although they're, they're counted as numbers, as a, a body count, these are all people whose lives have been taken, uh, many or most, from gang violence. And she's done a very good job bringing that to light. But she's the one who quoted the number 10% would be reported in the newspaper otherwise. But when you listen, if you get up early and you read the LA Times, and then you drive somewhere in the car and you listen to the, the radio uh, on the news, all they do is read from the paper. They, most often, they don't do their own work. They read the LA Times over the radio to you. So you're getting inundated with the same stories over and over again. So your perception is, my God, there's crime everywhere. It makes it sound an awful lot worse than it is because I think people are being, in the media, oftentimes lazy and reporting the same things. You know, when we were kids, you'd have uh, the 6 o'clock news and the 11 o'clock news, and it was a half an hour each one of them. 
And today it's 24-7 news all the time. And if you continue to watch the news, you hear the same stories repeated. And even if you're not really watching it, it's just on you're in your subliminal conscious, you know, you're being inundated with blood and guts and gore. I want to give our students and uh, guests in the room an opportunity to ask some questions of our panelists. Yeah, um, this is basically for the whole panel. Um, Council Member Weiss, um, I actually live in your district on Pico and Overland, and um, I went to public school my whole life, and I went to a high school where uh, half the kids in my ninth grade class didn't graduate. Um, Three years ago, I had a car drive into my living room because Overland's way too narrow, and I hear things about expanding it and everything. And um, um, I'm just wondering, I hear a lot of things, like I used to take the bus, and I know how that is, and I'm just wondering, like, how would you personally want to change things? And I have a question for um, Mr. Cooley and Chief McDonald. Would you rather have um, more police officers or more, more kids graduate from high school? I don't think they're mutually exclusive concepts. Uh, th this city is historically, chronically, underpoliced. Uh, so I think that you've got you've got to uh, assure public safety, uh, but the other goal is certainly uh, worthy. And I think that someone else is going to have to uh, do the right thing to make that happen. And we have um, some serious challenges at the LAUSD. If they don't have a diploma, I mean, if they don't have a diploma, they're, they're going to become part of the system where we have to mm -hmm. handle them, and that's unfortunate. We have a question here, here, and in the back. This is a question for Chief, Chief McDonald and Councilman Weiss. Feel free to chime in. I know with the LAPD historically, in the last few years, it's been hard to retain the personnel uh, necessary to maintain that force of 10,000. Uh, what do you think is required or necessary to really retain the, the officers from going to other agencies? That's a great question, and that has been a challenge for us. It was a bigger challenge for us pre-92. Uh, it's an, an organization that's a people business, and the people in the organization didn't feel that they were being respected or that their talents were being optimized, so they chose to uh, voice that with their feet in many cases. We have a pension system set up uh, that's designed to keep people for their career, uh, modifications were made over the years in that so that you could leave after 10 years and still be vested. So some people have chosen to do that. But the reality it is we live in an environment here that's very expensive to live in the city or in, in the area around the, surrounding the city. We have uh, people who come on the job at 21 to, to 27 generally, young people, starting families. Many of them, as far as affordability, have to live way out. And their commutes are an hour and a half, two hours in some cases. Uh, when you look at the job of a police officer, that you come in and you work your shift, you work a lot of overtime, and then you have to be back in court oftentimes the next day on your either your day off or, or in the time that you would have off between <laughs> shifts. So very demanding on the individual, very demanding on family life, and a lot of people then who have the opportunity to go out uh, in areas that are being developed, Temecula and Moreno Valley and places like that, Santa Clarita and North, uh, tend to do that. It's a safer environment oftentimes for many of them to do that. Uh, it's more conducive to family life. And so for us to retain people, things have to be working well. They have to feel respected. They have to feel well compensated. They have to feel that their talents are being used and that it's a good environment to work in. It's a supportive community and that management is supportive of what they're, what they're doing out there. And so often what they do is, I mean, we, we look at, at the actions of a police officer that he has, maybe he or she has, you know, a second or less to make in his life or death. And we will evaluate that for the next year down to the, uh, to the most minute detail, we'll do recreations on some use of force cases that, you know, at, with the benefit of a year's investigation, 100 interviews, and a, a computer reenactment of the thing, we come up with the decision, and the community comes up with the decision. Uh, and, and when they had less than a second to be able to make that decision or be gone. And so we have to, I think, take a step back and realize are we asking, are we asking too much in some cases of people? Are we being reasonable with people? because that message then goes out to our best recruiters are our own cops. And if, they, if they're telling their brothers, their sisters, their friends and relatives, this is a great job, come on board, then that's exactly what we see. If they don't feel that way, we start to see the, the numbers going off on the recruitment side. So it's, it's a constant balance between uh, being completely accountable and being reasonable, as well as the, the supportive piece, being supportive, 
uh, being an advocate for the community because at the end of the day they're there to protect and serve the community, but to be cognizant of the needs of the individuals as well. I can't add to that. That's a great answer. Mm -hmm. Oh, this question is for D.A. Cooley and everyone else on the panel. Uh, over the summer we had the Paris Hilton, uh, Paris Hilton incident and I know in Hollywood and the special treatment, can you explain about what happened? I know it was a bickering between the city attorney and your office and the sheriff's office. It was a million press conferences. We, 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 did not, we did not prosecute Paris Hilton. She was prosecuted for misdemeanor uh, DUI that occurred in the city of Los Angeles. She was on uh, probation for a misdemeanor. She, her probation was violated by the city attorney. Uh, our office had nothing to do with Paris Hilton. Why she was early released, the fact of the matter is the sheriff uh, is under a consent decree and has been granted the powers to accommodate the uh, population in his jails by releasing some, uh, allowing others to be released even without even going to county jail if their bail didn't hit a certain point. He has a wide variety of, had a wide variety of options <clears throat> to manage the population. What confronts the sheriff uh, is inadequate facilities. They used to have facilities for 20,000. We add 2 million people to the county. Now we have facilities for like 14,000 or 15,000. So these are re reduced facilities, increased population, increase in illegal immigration, and some of that population does commit crimes where they go to uh, county jail and get holds placed on them. And so <clears throat> he was forced uh, within the confines of the consent decree to come up with early release programs. Paris Hilton's one or two days or whatever it was uh, she uh, ultimately did was quite frankly what would have normally happened to a normal person getting the sentence that she got. However, the city attorney, the current city attorney, in sort of a grandstand play, I wanted to get on TV and uh, make a big issue of it and sort of connect his, you know, get some, get some celebrity towards him because it's Paris Hilton after all. And he brought a uh, contempt uh, filing against Sheriff Baca and, uh, and to sort of, let's say, Paris Hilton's being treated like a celebrity. Paris Hilton's early release is what Paris Hilton would have gotten if her name would have been uh, Sally Smith. That's, that's really the way our county jail system has become so overcrowded and dysfunctional that sentences are meted out or not actually being served. But I think, I'm watching the sheriff the last six months, he's come up with other approaches to this. Uh, we are now seeing, at least among males, uh, in fact they're doing in the 65, 70, um, sometimes 80 percent of what their sentence would have been otherwise under an optimum situation. So. A lot of improvement going on in the, in the jail situation. I get your question about the celebrity. They're going to, have to get Rocky Delgadillo back here for that, get the actual answer for that one. Paul. Oh. Yeah, this is for Jim McDonald. I know that Chief Bratton has been quoted as saying that if you give me 4,000 more officers, I'll give you the safest city in the world. What do you think is an appropriate number? Do you agree with Councilman Weiss in 10,000, or I just want to get your thoughts? Yeah, I, I think, and thank you for that question. That's a great one because we're asked that all the time, and I don't know that we can come up with what the optimal number is. I don't think we need uh, twice what we have, which would be uh, commensurate with what they have in Chicago, New York, and Philadelphia. I think that if we were able to hit that range of, of 14,000 overall, that we would have the safest big city in America. When I look at it, as I mentioned earlier, what we can do with an additional 100 officers put into a hotspot area, the crime dries up. And, I, and I've seen throughout my career, whenever we have flare-ups in violence, particularly gang violence, and we put a lot of extra officers in there, or, or we have uh, a unit, Metropolitan Division, that's our citywide crime suppression task force. And that's the bodies that we can move around with discretion around the city. They're not assigned to any one area throughout the city. And we move them on a nightly basis to different places depending on what the problems are. When Metro's in the area, or when we have additional officers in the area, they're bumping into each other on the street, the suspects don't come out. There aren't, there aren't incidents of violent crime or even property crime. It's amazing what, with what a relatively small number of additional officers in an area will do to that area. Crime goes underground, and it's like putting your hand on a waterbed. As soon as you take it off, it comes up, or as soon as you put it on, it comes up somewhere else, and that's what we see. We see displacement 
based on the fact that if we pull the officers from here and put them here, then something happens back here. We don't have enough to blanket the city with enough officers as a deterrent effect throughout the city. Um, so 14,000 would be, I think, would be a great number. Uh, Mr. Weiss talked about 10,000. We have never reached 10,000. Uh, it would be the first time, uh, if we keep going, that we will have passed that 10,000 mark, and that's a good start. Um, but we need to go further than that, I think, to get to get the best bang we, we can for the buck. When you look at money invested in officers on the street, it comes back to us, I'd say, tenfold, because everything is tied to public safety and perception of safety in the city. People won't won't come in and live here. They won't move their families in. They won't move their business into the city if they don't feel it's going to be a safe environment for them. And when you look at people, look at the, uh, the Staples Center and that area surrounding their LA Live, if you haven't been down there lately, it's worth going down to see what that'll be. It will be the Times Square of the West. And that has the potential to bring people in from all over the region to go there for entertainment. But if their perception is that you're going to get shot going down there, or you're going to get robbed, or your car's going to get stolen or broken into, they're not going to come. And you think about what one incident can, can do. You look at back in 1985 when Karen Toshima was killed in Westwood Village. Westwood Village was the place to go for many, many years. As soon as that happened, it became known as a gang area. You know, and that they, had, they were open to gang problems, which wasn't fair, to, but it was the perception. And it was spread, you know, by the media. And we saw Westwood not being what it used to be. And the, and the loss in, in earnings and potential and revenue for the city was very dramatic. So I think that the money we spend on additional officers, provided they're well-managed, well-led, and held accountable, is money very well spent. And just very quickly, I, <clears throat> I don't think I gave the impression, but I certainly didn't want to give the impression that I'm saying 10,000 is the right number and you stop there. Um, I was responding to Professor Garrow's question of, do you stop the hiring plan that we have in place now? That plan is designed to get us over 10,000 by a little bit. That's what that funding stream will provide. I agree with the chief. We, uh, we should go farther. There are different ways to get there. They all involve raising revenue, whether that's taxes or fees or what have you in the city, and, and I'm willing to do that. We've got a Thank question you. right in the front and then way in the back. Hi. Um, first of all, I want to thank all the panelists for being here. I really respect all the work that you do. I'd like to echo the concern of the first student regarding the correlation between violence, youth violence, and education. I watched in the news when Mayor Villaraigosa said, we will not back down. We will increase the police force. The next clip was of a youth that said, what I need is youth programs. When you get up and you ain't got nothing to do with us, a bad day. Mm -hmm. And as a director of a nonprofit in, in inner city Long Beach, I really understand that concern. So I heard Mr. Cooley's reference um, recidivism rates as well as uh, prevention programs and that accountability as an issue. So my specific question is for Council Member Weiss. Um, two questions. One, with the increased cost, increased funding for the police force, is there a corresponding increase the education budget, and two, what's being done right now to increase the accountability of our preventive programs? To increase the? The funding for education and increase the accountability for our preventive programs. Okay, on accountability, um, that's what we were talking about earlier, about centralizing the gang and youth programs in the mayor's office, and that's, and that's what I want to do, um, and, and I hope my colleagues agree. I, I don't think we can provide an answer that is as good as your question. Because I think all of us agree with everything that you stated in your question. Um, the first part of your question was about. Oh, okay, okay. Now, and that, that that goes back to the other my other gloom and doom theme, which is that right now we have this dysfunctional system in Los Angeles where we, as members of the council, uh, or Steve Cooley, as member of the DA, county supervisors, what have you have no control over the education budget. Um, first of all, it's largely fixed by state funding formulas. But secondly, the education funding decisions in this city are made by the LA Unified School District Board, which is a separately elected body that is completely, dis not completely, but largely disconnected from other governmental issues and other governmental pressures. I supported Mayor Villaraigosa when he tried to have control over education in this city uh, brought under uh, the office of the mayor, not under him personally, but under the office of the mayor. Until we uh, do a better job uh, with, with that, I, I can't, I mean, it's easy, I, it's easy for me to tell you I, I favor increased education funding. I have no formal or even informal 
lever that I can push to make that happen. That's why I wanted the change that the mayor was fighting for. Hi, um, thank you all for being here. Um, and I would like to say that um, March being Women's History Month, I'd like to thank specifically Patricia for all of the work that you've done um, for women in Los Angeles specifically. Um, I have two questions. Um, my first is um, that we've talked a lot about gang crimes and gang violence, um, but there's also a growing number of reported hate crimes in Los Angeles, um, which disproportionately affect um, lesbian gay and bisexual transgender people. So my question is um, what action um, in Los Angeles, having one of the largest LGBT population in the world, um, what work is being done to prevent this sort of a crime? And then secondly to Patricia, um, colleges and universities specifically and fraternities have a definite culture of rape. Um, and I'm wondering, um, we're now in a room full of student activists. Um, what is your advice for prevention um, of violence against women at LMU? Yeah, I think Patty I'll should take, take that question first because yeah. that's a, I mean, that's a part of your alley. Yeah, yeah, okay. we yeah. <laughs> well, colleges and universities certainly have an environment where there's um, at risk for sexual violence. And one of the things, um, that we're encouraging on campuses, and there, there is, um, there is a, there are campus rape prevention programs on many. I'm, I'm sure there. Are, I'm not familiar specifically with LMU, but at USC, UCLA, many of at many of the universities do have some specific programming because I know we're involved with them. I don't want to let them know about Denim Day. Specifically. I know that's what I'm about to say. But one of the things you can do, um, uh, and I really would love to support you doing this if anyone is interested in really spearheading this. April is Sexual Assault Awareness Month. April 23rd is Denim Day in LA. This is the, th the 10th annual Denim Day in LA. It is a sexual violence awareness prevention campaign. And the focus is uh, twofold. One is to support survivors, and the other is to prevent sexual violence. And the city of LA declares Denim Day, uh, the 50% uh, of the the cities in the county of Los Angeles declared Denim Day in LA on that day. People wear jeans on purpose, and it came out of an Italian Supreme Court um, uh, case that was overturned. They overturned a conviction of a, uh, a, a convicted uh, rapist because the judge in the Supreme Court said that since the young girl, I think she was 17, was wearing je tight jeans, the only way he could have gotten the genes off her was if she helped him, therefore it was consensual sex. So that was, that was 10 years ago. That happened in Italy, but 10 years ago, those same kind of attitudes were everywhere and still persist in, 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 in many places. Um, the uh, women in Rome, the parliamentarians, the women, wore jeans on the steps of the Supreme Court in protest. In Sacramento, our women legislators, along with some men, wore jeans in protest, and I saw that and I said, we all should be wearing jeans, we need to have a campaign. These lies, these myths, these misconceptions, there is not the right kind of education and dialogue and discussion going on about whether or not a girl or a woman deserves ever to be raped. That's the question. 10 years later, that is still the question. 2,000 years of violence against women, that is still the question. And many people think because if, she, if she's drinking, if she can't give consent, then it's not okay to have sex. So seeking consensual sex and all of those added, those things have to be brought out. People have to talk about this. Sexual violence is the least talked about of crimes. So Denim Day in LA is a campaign and I, I, we have materials. Uh, we will come out, we'll have speakers, if you want to have activities, April 23rd, the whole month uh, of April. So this would be something that, um, in terms of college campuses, and we're hoping that, that these kinds of interest, so that um, men and women, students, talk about together and bust each other's myths and hold each other accountable about their attitudes. I could jump on the, uh, the other piece, if there was no follow-up question. Um, as far as the 
LGBT community and hate crime, what do we do about that and, and how seriously is that taken? Um, I think you'd be amazed at uh, the response when we have a hate crime. Problem is, many of them are unreported, as, as are many other crimes. Uh, I'm on the uh, Anti-Defamation League's uh, Law Enforcement Advisory Committee, and we talk about hate crime every time we meet, and we report on it. We bring people from the law enforcement community in from uh, all seven counties in the uh, Southern California area to talk about what's going on. That information is shared with each other and with ADL. Uh, ADL is all over this and, and a real advocate for, for the prosecution of hate crime. Um, we work very closely with the Gay and Lesbian Center in Hollywood uh, on the education and the advocacy, advocacy piece on reporting uh, crimes against gay and lesbian, transgender, bisexual people. And it's been an evolution where there was very little reporting of, of those crimes years ago. Uh, and even, you know, as I said, underreporting today, but it is, we have come 180 degrees from where we were. Uh, in the LAPD, we have a, a variety of forums to give advice to the chief on what's going on in their communities, and one is the LGBT forum. And we have people involved from, from uh, all parts of the city uh, that represent L all LGBT uh, uh, populations, and they're very open with us and tell us, you know, the feedback we get from them has been, uh, you know, critical to how we deploy our people how much effort and, and time we're able to dedicate to hate crime investigations and how we, tra uh, how we uh, set that up to work with the prosecution. Uh, Steve Cooley shop has been super in coming to these meetings, but also in looking at the prosecution right from the beginning. We bring people in when the crime occurs. Uh, we bring prosecutors in for advice, legal advice, right from the beginning so that when we do search warrants, whether it's uh, on this issue, uh, Jack Weiss has been very, very, uh, working very closely with us on hate crimes, particularly as it relates to, uh, to crimes and uh, on religious-based crimes, uh, houses of worship, faith-based uh, crimes. Uh, it really is a team, and in this city, that works very well together, and it is taken very, very seriously. We've had a number of uh, crimes on, on houses of worship, for instance, where fire was involved, and we had the FBI and the ATF right, right up front with us on those things. So we not only look at, at city, uh, at county with the DA's office, uh, but also a federal prosecution for hate crime. So it is taken very serious, and I think, again, it's probably the model for the rest of the nation on, on hate crime investigation and, and really on the attitude toward hate crime. We have our last question right up here. My question is for District Attorneys Cooley and um, Chief McDonald. Um, Mr. Cooley, you spoke earlier about how we're really lacking with rehabilitation and mitigation programs. And you also spoke about how um, you know the, D the district attorney's office prides itself in its 92% conviction rate, and um, you know so often we see district attorneys pursuing the harshest sentences available to the court for gang crimes. Um, to balance this out, is the police department and the district attorney's office can you are you doing anything to build rehabilitation programs? What are you able to do and how are you doing this rather than just saying we're I, I did say that rehabilitation programs was sort of the weak link in the system. Re rehabilitation programs come after someone's convicted, after they're placed in some other setting that we have no control over. When someone goes to state prison, they're subject to <clears throat> the uh, State Department of Corrections and we're just, that's not our jurisdiction. We have no statutory authority. We do have some prevention programs, especially youth-oriented prevention programs, uh, the Protecting Our Kids program in terms of internet safety, uh, our project lead, things of that nature. That's mostly prevention. We have some intervention, our uh, joint program, uh, Juvenile Offender Intervention Network is remarkably successful. We received awards from the National Association of Counties, the American Bar Association, because it's innovative, it's efficient, and it's a measured success in terms of taking some juvenile offender, not putting them in the system, and then making sure they don't come back to the system. So there's lots of good things we do, but once we've convicted them, it's via con Dios. Uh, it, they go to state prison, and they go to county jail. The sheriff does a pretty good job on some rehabilitation programs. I think the state prison system, by and large, has failed as measured by our 71 percent recidivism rate of those people that are placed in the state prison system. But that's just not our job. And one thing you have to remember, whether you're a cop or a defense attorney or a prosecutor or a state corrections officer, is they give you a mission and it's defined. And it's usually defined either in the Constitution as in the case of the DA, 
uh, or is defined in some governmental code um, and uh, in the case of the state prison is the administrative code. We all take an oath to uphold the Constitution and the laws of the state of California. So um, we've not taken on missions that, that really aren't ours to take on. We can look at them and be critical, we can suggest ideas, but uh, we have to know our limitations too. I want, good thank, question. I want to thank our panel. Can I jump in? I finished. She asked me part of that. I just want oh, yeah, to touch you know, a little bit on the police part of that. Um, again, like Steve mentioned, you know, our resources are very limited. We have a mission, but we'll, to the degree that we can, we try and use education to be able to tell people who are coming out of the prison system, particularly those who have to register uh, for the crimes that they occurred, give them the lay of the land. Here's what our expectations are. Here's what we're going to be doing to follow up. So, so set the bar. <clears throat> but on top of that, I think then. Uh, I'm on a board with the Archdiocese of Los Angeles for the Office of Restorative Justice, and that's looking at innovative ways to reach out to people, particularly using the faith community, so that when they come out to some kind of a support base, that families can be educated, that they can use the faith community kind of as a crutch to transition back into uh, the life outside the prison walls. So that's really in its infancy, but I think it's something that could be replicated elsewhere and, and may become a model for what could be done across the country. I, I do want to thank our panel. I want to let our students know.